Welcome to the first episode of Books of Titans. I'm Jason Staples, together with Aaron Crosstad, and this podcast is dedicated to the influences of influencers, the books that have helped shape the prominent inventors, business leaders, athletes, intellectuals, scientists, and others profiled in Tim Ferriss's recent book, Tools of Titans. We'll talk about what makes these books so important and influential, and we'll at least attempt to have an intelligent discussion about each one of these important works. And we're going to be doing one book per per week basically for the year that's 52 books per year we encourage you to follow along with us uh there's a there's a website set up booksoftitans.com you can also follow us and and communicate with us on twitter or instagram at at books of titans uh plenty of different ways for everybody to follow through and uh and get a chance to read these books that have influenced the influencers that uh that tim ferris has uh has brought together in his book and also on his podcast and so on. Now, today we're going to cover The Inevitable by Kevin Kelly, a book focused on the 12 technological metaphors that will potentially shape our future. But uh, before we get to that, uh, just a quick note about the podcast episode to follow. Uh, this was the first, obviously, episode from this podcast series, and we had a few minor hiccups uh, in terms of sound as a, re- uh, as a result, as might be expected on any pilot episode, uh, including one place where our recording stopped, uh, unfortunately, right when the conversation was at its uh, very best. So uh, some of the uh, some of the best, I, I suppose, rants that both of us uh, went on late in the podcast episode were unfortunately lost, and we had to come back and re-record uh, a couple days later, which leads to a little bit of an unevenness uh, in this episode that uh, we should be able to avoid in future uh, editions. But You'll hear where we uh, where we put an intermission uh, that marks uh, a lot of conversation lost and picking up a couple days later. But uh, otherwise, enjoy the first episode as we pick up with who recommended the book in Tools of Titans. If you have the Tools of Titans book, it's a monster. And <laughs> if you go to page 426, you come across a gentleman by the name of Mark Goodman. Now, Mark Goodman's known mostly for writing the book called Future Crimes. Uh, I happened to read this book back in 2015. I liked the book a lot, and it's uh, oddly the antithesis of this book, and we'll we'll obviously get into that in this episode here. But um, Mark Goodman is is a self-titled global security advisor and futurist, and he can be found at Future Crimes. That's his Twitter name, and then at markgoodman.net online. Uh, I, I thoroughly enjoyed his book. He has a short, just little three-page section within Tools of Titans, but uh, recommended reading just on different ways that you can be manipulated with technology and how, um, how, you, how you can protect yourself. And so he, he recommended three books in his section, and one of them was The Inevitable by Kevin Kelly. No, I noticed um, one of the things that uh, that you'd actually mentioned. I haven't read uh, Future Crimes, uh, but uh, but you'd min- you'd previously mentioned uh, the chapter on in screens we trust as a big piece of uh, of what had struck you about that book. And and before we get into talking about Kevin Kelly's book, uh, why don't you let us know a little bit about that particular book or that particular chapter? Uh, as I do think that that has a lot to do sort of with what this book is addressing and, 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 uh, something we should probably, uh, have in mind as we, as we start. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. Uh, though the one thing I, I, that really sticks out from that book, because I, I could just kind of picture it in my head was, uh, this description of the ability, you know, if, if we start trusting everything we, we see on the screens, uh, that can all be manipulated. It's all brought to us through, through code. It's brought to us in different different manners and different size algorithms. algorithms and all these things can be manipulated. They're created by somebody. They can just as easily be altered by somebody. So we may not be seeing what is reality on these screens. And, and the one, the one very vivid example he gave was, was talking about pilots and their GPS is being, being altered to where they think they're 200 feet higher than they actually are. So if they came in for a landing uh, and they thought they were 200 feet higher. They were, 
bad weather or something, or if, if they came close to a, a mountain, they could just smash right into it. Which of course uh, so, is straight out of uh, out of Die Hard Two, right? I mean, that's uh, that's what they did with the uh, with the um, automatic landing system uh, to to crash one one of the jets in that. So uh, yeah, yep. Goodman probably Goodman probably watched that and said, yeah, they can still do that. And only now it's more persuasive with the GPS. Yeah, and which is a, a good segue into talking about Kevin Kelly because. He uh, also had a a role in a in a fairly important movie. Uh, in would you like to talk about that? Yeah, actually, it's one of those things. When I was when, when I was well, when I was reading through this uh, this book, when I was reading through um, the inevitable, there were a number of times where I kept going, "Man, this is like mini- M- Minority Report stuff that he's talking about here." And then we get to a, there's a part in one of the later chapters where he says, "Yeah, you know, when I was an advisor to Steven Spielberg for the movie Re- Minority Report." It's like, oh, <laughs> yep. that would explain why so much of this, you know, future expected future is starting to sound an awful lot like Minority Report, because Kevin Kelly was one of the advisors to, to Spielberg on that. Now, uh, you can you can talk yeah. a little bit more about the guy that actually Tim Ferriss calls the most interesting man alive here. Uh, again, you you put put together uh, a, a good bio here, so uh, let's let's address that before we get into the book itself. Yeah, one one thing I thought was very interesting is that he does not have any college or university degrees, um, yet he interviews some of the top tech guys in the world. Has written some uh, great articles and and books. Um, he was a founding executive director of Wired magazine, and that was in 1993. So uh, he's he's had a big big influence on the tech industry and and what he writes about. Uh, you would think a guy that is writing about tech all the time would uh, be completely immersed in it. But one really, really funny thing that we found out about Kevin Kelly in, in uh, the process of, of reading this book is that he hangs out with the Amish and he hangs out with the Amish on a regular basis and, and even wears an Amish beard. So um, <laughs> and he brings up the Amish uh, in, in the book at, at one point. And, uh, and that was, that was just a neat thing when you think of somebody who's kind of uh all in on the on on tech, and as we'll see in this book, is is very uh, optimistic about tech. Uh, one th- one also one other thing I wanted to to bring up too was was a, a amazing article that he wrote called "One Thousand True Fans," and if you've read Tools of Titans, Ferris actually quotes, I, I believe the that entire yeah, it's article. reprinted pretty much reprinted yeah, straight up in that in, in tools of titans it is one of the more influential pieces i think by anybody in in the tech industry or in marketing and so on it's it's a it's a must read and it, and it really puts things into a doable situation if you can get a thousand fans for your idea your company your music your art you can you can make it and that that's the guy's point um but it, the way the way he presents it uh, you know you don't need a million people to like you you don't need a um, uh, sometimes I think we, we think our, we have to get to way higher than we actually need to. And, and just by, uh, the way he did, he writes this article is, is really interesting just to, that you really just need a thousand, a thousand true fans. Yeah. And, 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 and I think the, again, the point there that, that he makes throughout that is that, you know, everybody chases the big thing, but it's really having enough of the small stuff, uh, you know, the grassroots stuff is really what wins. Uh, grassroots mm-hmm. level stuff is actually where uh, you know all, all all of these major things that we look at start. Uh, you don't start with a million fans, you, but if you can get to a thousand, then you might be able to to really expand into something something really big. But uh, if you start to try to aim for for too big of a, an audience, and this is something that as an author myself, uh, one of the things that I have to worry about as I'm anytime I'm writing something uh, is you have to consider your audience. You can't write for everyone. If you're writing for mm-hmm. everyone, you know, it's the old Steve Jobs thing. If, if, if everybody's happy, then you don't have a product. Mm-hmm. If, you know, it's, it's uh, you know, if, if you're writing for everyone, then you're writing for no one. And so, you know, that I think 1000 true fans really hits that on the head in a way that really boils that down uh, to a, uh, in, in an understandable way. But uh, as for us, let's go ahead and uh, 
move into the next segment of this particular show uh, where we're going to talk about our favorite quotes from the book before we then move into our overview and initial reactions from the book, looking at some big picture stuff uh, on, uh, about the book. But let's go ahead in, and discuss our favorite quotes. Eric, you go first with uh, with quote number one. I guess we both we each we each were uh, we each had some trouble choosing just one, so uh, we'll, we each had two here. So, favorite quotes from the book. Yeah, yeah, we both we both cheated. <laughs> uh, my first one is. Uh, it, I had to include two because one, I just, I love, I love the quote. And then uh, this, the one I'm going to start out with is, is really the genesis of this project of, of reading through 52 books in 2017 uh, uh, books that were suggested by those interviewed in tools of Titans. And that is that uh, here, here's the exact quote. Life is short and there are too many books to read. Someone or something has to choose or whisper in our ear to help us decide. And I like that quote because it, that's the reason that we're doing this. And uh, I'm, I always am a sucker for those, uh, the clickbait where it says, you know, here's the five books that, that Warren Buffett thinks everyone should read, or here's, here's uh, Bill Gates' favorite books. Uh, I, I will click that link every single time. <laughs> and, and so I'm always interested. And here, here's a, a, what, 600 page book that is full of the, suggested and most gifted books by people that have, that have, have really influenced us or we've grown up with, or even recently people like Dan Carlin that, um, that we listen to on a regular basis. Hardcore and just history, to hear common what, sense, man. One of the best yeah, podcasters and, out there. Yep. And to hear what has influenced these people, I, I thought that was just a great place to start with uh, a, a reading list for, for the year. So that was my first favorite quote from the book. And the second one is a short one, and it is banning the inevitable usually backfires. So I thought that was a clever, uh, clever little statement to go along with the, the title of the book, The Inevitable. Yeah, it's a pithy little way to get at what a lot of economists talk about. And, you know, this there are some some great examples of this in uh, modern American history, uh, one of which is uh, is um, is prohibition. When you ban alcohol and everybody wants it, when it's an inelastic good, um, that's going to backfire. And uh, mm -hmm. we've seen it again with the war on drugs. Uh, when, when there's stuff that people really want, when it's inevitable that people are going to do it, when it's inelastic, uh, as economists say, um, trying to ban it, trying to, uh, to prevent people from, from, from doing it is going to backfire. And, uh, and, and I think mm -hmm. that... that <laughs> He nailed it with that particular quote. That's one actually I, I had forgotten when I was putting my quotes together, uh, and it might have made my list otherwise. Uh, one of uh, one of my favorites. Uh, uh, I'll go ahead and just quote it now. Indeed, it is a rare author who is forced to invent new words. Even the greatest writers do their magic primarily by remixing formerly used, commonly shared ones, which actually comes in the same chapter as your second one, Banning the Inevitable Usually Backfires, and it's on that, that same concept. Because what he's saying is that, that the way that the internet basically makes everything uh, so easy to copy and all of these things, and now our copyright law is trying to deal with with all of this remixing and, and appropriating and sampling of, of various, uh, uh, various material, it's not well equipped to do that. And as, as we all know, there's no putting that genie back in the bottle. You cannot prevent people from download, from uploading and sharing their remix or their, their version of whatever you, whatever you've copyright, copyrighted. There's just no way around that. And as he put it at some level, that that's what art is anyway. You can't copy ideas to some degree really can't be copyrighted or patented in, in the way that we we've done it in uh, when it's when it's material. Uh, we, the, you know, we have material patents and things like that that can work really well when you have the scarcity of material where materiality where you have to print a book or you have to you know create something. But as soon as it's easy, you're trying to ban the inevitable at that point and it And, you know, ultimately. Art and all of those things involve just remixing and uh, and putting things back together. So that's one thing that uh, one one of the quotes that I really enjoyed. Another well, one. That, if I could just uh, interject real yeah, quickly, uh, one of the one of the authors that is is going to be on our our list in uh, I think it's the first 10, 10 books is Austin Cleon, and uh, 
the book that we're reading is not this one, but one of his books is is called Steal Like an Artist, <laughs> and which, which he basically just gives you the ways to to all you know all artists steal, and here's how you can steal to be a, a great artist. So uh, I thought that was a kind of inter uh, that he wrote that book, and we will be reading one of his well, books. The, sa- uh, the same thing. This. The same thing also shows up in Natural Born Heroes, which is uh, I think number four on our list. Uh, mm-hmm. Where you know he he talks about how the uh, the, the Cretans, w- which he follows you know a good bit, uh, that you know stealing is so much of uh, their sort of it's it's looked it's not looked at as entirely a negative thing in in Cretan culture. Although I think he exaggerates that a little bit, but uh, we'll, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit there. But the idea that uh, that looking up to the great thieves of history like Odysseus. Uh, really does, you know, call into into in, into uh, into mind the fact that to some degree we all steal from each other every day, all the time, and that's just you know that's just human existence. So my second uh, my second quote is uh, one that I don't really enjoy so much, but I think he he put it so beautifully uh, that uh, I had to include it, and that is quote endless newbie is now the new def- er, try that again quote endless newbie is the new default for everyone, no matter your age or experience, end quote. And basically, he's talking about how the, the pace of progress on, in technology and all these other things, and also the tendency for things to release in beta, basically, means that everybody has to update and relearn new UIs and new devices and all these things so quickly that by the time you're comfortable with whatever you've got, it's, it's obsolete and outdated, which means that everybody's always having to relearn, like, wait, how do I do this again? So, you know, in the past, you know, you could kind of make fun of the old people who were, you know, oh, great. Yeah. You can't even work a cell phone. Well, geez, you know, just give, give, give it a couple of years and you're going to have to relearn how to use, you know, every one of your apps. So, uh, you know, this is, this is the new default. And, uh, and I think he, he's absolutely right about that. And he talked about how he was not a, um, he's, he was not a, an early adopter when it came to updates and things like that, but it got to the point where, if you delay on the updates and you don't upgrade in time, then all of a sudden the learning curve gets really steep and, and everything that you've got ends up being completely obsolete. So, you know, he got onto a normal uh, upgrade schedule himself, which, again, as he put it, puts us all in the position of being endless newbies. Now, on to our next segment. This is where we're going to really start talking about the book itself. And uh, for this segment, we're looking bi- really at the big picture, the bird's eye view, what ultimately the book is trying to get across the basic, you know, if you don't know anything else about this book, this is what it's doing, the basic thesis of the book. And ultimately what that is, is Kelly tries to boil down technological progress, particularly digital progress, uh, into 12 meta forces that will ultimately shape the direction that technology develops in for the foreseeable future. So essentially, and also really, as he talks about it, the unforeseeable future. So really a way to think about this is this book is trying to explain sort of the laws of nature for digital and technological progress. So as he describes it, basically gravity and other things like that uh, are what shape the, the realm of possibility and how things work in the natural world. Well, there are certain meta forces that just happen to be on the, ba- that happen to be in terms of how progress works in the realm of technology because of human psychology, the limitations of, uh, of materials and things like that, that the, or the lack of limitations in some cases that these particular, these 12 what he sees as meta forces end up shaping the way that technology is going to is going to end up developing. So it's not so much about what the next tablet's going to look like or what the you know what what our devices will uh, will you know what what the next big in innovation is going to be by you know Apple or IBM or something. He's not talking about that. What he's talking about is in fifteen years, where will the trends of technology, of our current technological development, where will those trends end up taking us? 
that's really what he's trying to do. And, and then, you know, one of the things that you really liked about this book in particular, uh, Eric, was what he does at the end of each chapter where he, he takes sort of a look forward and a look back. Why don't you tell us a little bit about that? I know you wanted to talk about this a good bit. Yeah, he he looks out and if I recall correctly, the, the different chapters would be different time periods. So one time might be 10 years in the future or 20 or 50 in what he thinks life would, would look like. And it's based off what has happened in the past and then taking that to the present and also being honest where he missed things about the present, where he, he thought it would go one way and it went a completely different way. And I guess extrapolating that to to the future and doing that w- within each of these 12, 12 metaphors. Yeah. So, I mean, for becoming or for cognifying or different things like that, some of these forces that will break down in in the next uh, more detailed segment, each one of those things, okay, in 15, 20, 40 years, how might this trend end up uh, working its way out in in someone's life? What would the morning look like? That sort of thing. So, you know, it's an interesting way to go about it. And it's a way, you know, it's very much a Walt Disney type way of imagining the future, uh, and, and ultimately, none of the things that he says in terms of how things are actually going to be, when, when we look back at this in you know, 20, 30 years, it's going to be kind of ridiculous in many respects, but it, there's bound to be things in terms of the trends that he'll have gotten right. And, and I think that's more the point. He's not trying to get every detail right. He's trying to paint a picture to stoke the imagination of what life might be like in each one of those cases. Um, now, Eric, you had a little bit of a different reaction to this book, uh, than I did. Uh, I know you had, I think a significantly more positive reaction than I did. Uh, why don't you go ahead and, and explain sort of your initial reactions to, uh, your big picture reactions to Kelly's, uh, Kelly's metaphors and his descriptions here. Yeah. And I'm going to start with, uh, an, ep- an example from Epcot in Florida, uh, part of the Disney, Disney park there. Uh, the first ride, the, the big ball, when you go in, I remember riding that as a kid and, and you ride through it and you're looking at what they expect the future to be. And there's some space things and uh, a lot of technology things. And I just remember being a kid and looking at these things and I was like, there, there's just no way this stuff's going to be, uh, in my lifetime, uh, that, you know, this is probably hundred, 200, 300 years ahead. But almost every single thing in that ride is now here. Uh, One of the things I remember most vividly is uh, a family talking with their grandparents into a tablet screen. And and this is back in the 80s. And I just remember looking at that and and just thinking, wow, that's that's amazing. And, and, you know, last night we we spoke with my wife's grandparents on 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 the iPad. And so it's here. The future's here. And I thought this book did a great job of doing is, uh, I, I, I felt like it's now that Epcot ride to me when I was a kid that, that this book was almost a, a, a look into the future and a way to see some things that could potentially happen, uh, the way things could potentially go. And I, I really enjoyed that part of the book. Secondly, I thought overall it was a great overview of key mindset shifts that are required for thriving in this new world. Uh, he just talks about a lot of uh, different ideas, for instance, like the one Jason just brought up with being a newbie. Uh, I thought that was brilliant because I work with people all the time that uh, they say, well, I, I don't know how to do this. I can't do this. And I, some part of it is, is they're not trying, but you you really can't be that way anymore because your, your refrigerator soon might be connected to the internet. And if you don't know how to use it, you, you know, it's, you've always got to be in that, mo- that mode of, of, um, of learning and, and it, it creates it, or it requires, I guess, a humility to, to realize that you are going to have to be constantly learning and you're, you're, you're never going to arrive there. Uh, so I, I liked, um, that, overview of just the, the key mindset shifts required. And then uh, one of the third things it, I really liked was towards the end of each chapter, Kevin Kelly would 
talk about what he expected life to be for him in 10, 20, 50 years from now, what he sees himself doing based on some of the trends that he's predicting or a hypothetical um, version of himself alive at that time, you know, something like that. Yeah. 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 And my third major takeaway was the end of the chapters of, of the looking into the future, 10, 20, 50 years. He just brought up a number of things that I'd never considered before. I'd never thought of, never read about, never seen anyone else write about those things. And to me, that was very interesting and, and just thought provoking and really blew my mind at some points at the, at, at some of the things he thought could could be coming our way in the near future. Yeah, that, it's it's funny you, you you bring that up. You also brought up the the comparison to Epcot because because I had very uh, almost the opposite response to certain parts of this book uh, to, to what you did, and 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 that uh, to some degree makes uh, I think the book maybe more interesting because uh, I found the book just almost insufferably optimistic uh, and at times naive, which surprised me a little bit because, again, you know, Kelly is a guy who has been around the block when it comes to technology. He's been there from the beginning, although you got to say, you got to admit that, you know, if he'd really had foresight, it wouldn't be called Wired Magazine. It would be Wireless Magazine. But, you know, anyway. <laughs> um, but uh, but no, I mean, he's been around the block. He knows that that uh, that technology has not always developed uh, in in positive ways, or in that you know he he uh, repeatedly talks about how difficult it is to predict anything with technology. But you know this book, even though he did a really good job of of describing a lot of the trends that we're seeing, and I think uh, did a terrific job of explaining sort of where we've come from to where we are now and describing that trend line in a lot of respects. I think he does a great job of that. But as soon as he started extrapolating into the future, the book really started to remind me of the optimism at the turn of the 20th century and, you know, post-war Walt Disney type utopic thinking, um, which each one of these was disappointed. I mean, you think about Actually, it's funny. You, again, you brought up the Epcot thing about you know going going when you were a kid and and how so many of those things now exist and and uh, you know things like you know talking to somebody on you know uh, on the telephone with video and all that. Well, the thing is, there was video phone in those days. I mean, yeah. video phone has existed since the 1960s, and that's actually something. If you remember, uh, we'll talk about in a, in a, in, uh, a couple of weeks about the, uh, the, the 22 immutable laws of marketing. One of the things that the older version of the 22 immutable laws talks about is why video phone didn't catch on. And they're like, you know, we've had this mm -hmm. technology since the sixties, but you know, they're writing in the eighties and you know, it still hasn't caught on and it probably never will. Well, yeah, well now we're seeing the maturity of that, of that technology finally with, with FaceTime and, and Skype and other things where we have video chatting the same way, although it still is not, uh, to popular to the degree uh, that that telephone is and probably never will be. I mean, there are many positive things about talking when you can't see someone else. Uh, you know, that's that's one of the beauties of being able to do you know a business meeting where you actually don't have to wear clothes. Uh, you know, that that sort of thing uh, isn't possible when everything's on video. But uh, but in any case, there when you go through Epcot today, yes, there are a lot of things that. You look at it and you say, wow, we actually exceeded what the expectation was there. You know, you look at, you know, the old Dick Tracy, you know, uh, uh, comics and things like that, where, you know, he's got the the uh, the watch with a radio on it and communication and all that stuff. And, you know, the Apple watch is far and ahead, way, way more advanced than anything that those people could have could have imagined. But mm -hmm. at the same point, when we start to look at how people at the turn of like you go to the World's Fair from the turn of the 20th century and you go to and you look at what they're expecting the world to look like a hundred years later, and it's 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 actually really sad in many respects uh, 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 in terms of how far we've fallen short on so many of the of their expectations, particularly that have to do with how human beings will use that technology that we've been able to put together. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the idea that we'd be flying around a lot more than we are, of course, is, is something that it has been more disappointing. I mean, I'm still disappointed that we're not flying to work every day instead of getting into a car. But, um, 
but you know there there have been limitations in certain areas of uh, of technology that that have been perhaps surprising to a lot of those futurists, and then there have been areas where we've vastly outstripped expectations. So mm-hmm. you know I I. I I just found there were there were certain places where I kept going, well, yeah, that that trend line may go this direction, but what happens if this you know multinational corporation happens to bend it to their to their benefit, which is almost certainly going to be the attempt? What happens then? And things mm-hmm. p- potentially go v- very very differently because of the the, the way that people are. <laughs> And I think, yeah. you know, he, in a lot of cases, gets the trend lines right on, oh, yeah, you know, we'll have the ability to you know, hyperlink all this other stuff. And we'll have the ability to to um, to search video and do things like like that, that we, we just don't have the capacity to do at this point. But who's going to be in control of that? And what's what what are the results of that going to be for daily life? And I thought once he got into those things of what the results would be for daily life, it reminded me of those old world fair type things where it just looked unbelievably utopic and, and didn't really account for both the sort of animalistic materiality that human beings have. I mean, we're all, we're all wrapped up in this fleshly muscular thing, this body that keeps us firmly, firmly, you know, feet on the ground and keeps us from being able to live out the platonic, uh, you know, idealism of this kind of utopic thinking that, that I think was reflected in many places throughout this book. So that was my biggest takeaway over and over again. But at the same point, I think, you know, you, 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 your observation about how it puts things in line with the past, I think that, that, that was a, a, a really, a, a, one of the big, big, other big takeaways, and this was where it was really positive, is thinking about where were things 20, 40, 50 years ago versus now? And what would we have been surprised about then? And and you, you probably could say a little bit more about that. Well, yeah, for, for me, I, I, you know, you, you, as a kid, you, you get your, your family gets the first computer. Uh, and then all of a sudden there's internet and then you go and get your first phone and all all these things happened so quickly. Yeah, just for that, perspective, Eric. Eric, how old are you? <laughs> yeah, I'm about to be thirty seven. Yeah, and I'm thirty five. So th- we we happen to be right at the cusp of the quote unquote digital natives, uh, where we actually remember getting internet and <laughs> we actually remember yeah. there, you know, not being cell phones and those things. Uh, many of our listeners are probably not in that, not in that boat, not in that boat anymore. I mean, I remember, you know, records and cassette tapes and things, you know, those, those are the things that the magnetic tape and all that, for those of you out there, I suggest that, that who aren't familiar with those, I suggest you Google them, but anyway, uh, continue, Eric. Well, and, and then I, I would use some of these things, but I was, I was scared to death of technology and it wasn't until, until grad school when I, when I had a professor kind of, uh, share some of the basics of, of coding and, and web development to where I, I really started getting more involved. So I, I went from having the sphere of technology to still having fear of, of, uh, of new, new technology and, and the complication of it all. But, uh, but I guess being more in tune with it to where in the last few years, I've really tried to read more of the books on how everything got started, how some of the open source things got started. So to read The Inevitable was, was I, I enjoyed it because it took the, everything I've lived through and put it into context. And, and it helped me just kind of define what I've lived through and make sense of, of the, the technological side of things in, in a new way. Uh, so I, I really appreciated that, that part of the book. Yeah. And, and I mean, now you make your living, uh, dealing with technology as, as much as, as uh, about as much as anybody. And, and, you know, that, uh, so, well, so that, that's the, that's the other interesting and, thing. Yeah. And when I, you when I went to college, what I'm doing now did, did not even exist. <laughs> yeah. You know, and, so, 
it's it's a different world. Like, I mean, we're podcasting at the moment. Yeah, I mean, who would have yeah. who would have thought that would that would be? But uh, and I do agree that that really that is the best thing about the book. It's more the retrospective and present focused aspects of the book, of saying, you know, guys, do you do you not remember where we were forty years ago? I mean, this is what people were thinking forty years ago. This is what people were doing forty years ago, and here's where we are now. Very few people on the planet are better equipped to talk about that aspect of things than Kevin Kelly is. And I think he really does a great job of bringing, you know, his whole complement of of experience in Silicon Valley and and with all of these various inventors and so on and, and, and tech moguls over the years and talking about what has worked, what was expected to work back in the 80s, what was expected to work in the 90s and so on and what actually has worked. And, and to me, that was that was probably the best thing about the book that along with some of the discussions about some of the, you know, forthcoming legal issues or the continued legal issues that we're going to have in terms of uh, of technology bringing up legal issues that that pr- at present don't exist or didn't exist 15 years ago, but now exist things like copyright and patent protections and things like that. Uh, and, you know, what happens with driverless cars and those sorts of things. I mean, there's a lot of legal issues that are going to be, need to be hammered out as the pace of technology quickens and, and our systems, our legal systems are so far behind on this and it's, and, and they're not equipped to be able to adjust at the rate of technological expansion. And some of his discussions on that I thought were, were quite good. Uh, Mm -hmm. Now I'm not the only, as it turns out, person who, when Kelly comes up in his particular utopic brand of thinking uh, comes up. I, I apparently am not the only one out there. I know you had had pulled some other stuff together. Uh, that there are others like me who are significantly more negative about the future than than Kelly is. And and uh, you had suggested, I know, uh, in in some of our conversation that that this book should be paired with with some of that stuff. So let you say a little bit more there. Yeah, one gentleman by the name of Nicholas Carr. Uh, I hear his name come up in uh, in different podcasts that I listen to. One is Six Pixels of Separation, and then the other one is Art of Manliness. And both of the podcasts had Kevin Kelly on, and more recently they've had Nicholas Carr on. And when they have Nicholas Carr on, they call him the anti-Kelly. That's how they introduce <laughs> him. So it's it's uh, it's actually quite intriguing to listen to Kevin Kelly on those podcasts and then, and then to listen to Nicholas Carr. Yeah, so Nicholas I, Carr, I would, by the way, would, on Twitter is at Rough Type. Uh, at on on Twitter at Rough Type. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, so I, I would I would assume that you are going to fall more in line with uh, with Mr. Carr. Yeah, I mean, I I think again, Kelly got a lot of the present day trends right, but whenever he extrapolated to the future, there were times where you know I was taking the notes that I had you know in this were this kind of sounds horrifying or. Um, wow. Uh, so people are going to have a lot of time, uh, in the future, huh? Um, or, you know, one, one thing actually that, (laughs) that I found really interesting about Kelly's rhetoric in terms of technology and progress is I actually thought that his picture of what technology was going to grow into in the near future wound up being strikingly close to certain conceptions of God. So for Mm -hmm. him, you know, technology specifically technology connected by the internet and the internet of things is going to join all human minds everywhere. I mean, this is, this is sort of a, um, it's, a, you know, kind of a Jungian kind of idea of, of God or the, you know, the, the, uh, the world consciousness kind of idea, but it's going to be the sum total of human minds all joined together. Everybody always tapped in at all times, providing access to the total knowledge of human history and more. Uh, you know, it, it's it's immaterial, but it's everywhere. It's ideal in 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 scope. It, there's just so much of that that sounds like certain conceptions of God, and you know, it also there there are times where I thought Kelly's perspective on this was was limited by both his optimism about human nature which i'm i think significantly more pessimistic about than than kelly is as far as i can tell uh and um and and also the 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 reality of materiality and time i mean there were a lot of places where i thought kelly was constructing a future world where 
essentially people wouldn't be constrained by materiality. And, and that just seemed really fanciful to me. Like, oh, yeah, you know, we're going to when you read a book, it's going to be, um, you know, joined with all of the other books of human history. So it's not going to be like you, you would necessarily read one book linearly. It's just going to be a deep dive. And all of a sudden it's going to be hyperlinked to everything else. Well, maybe that, that possibility is going to be there, but I'm very skeptical as to how well we as human beings will be able to handle that level of interconnection because, fr frankly, it's intellectually exhausting. I mean, that's part of what my research, that kind of research is, is the sort of thing that, that I do on, uh, in, in dealing with texts and all that. And when you start to hyperlink stuff like that so thoroughly it's really exhausting to try to follow that through. And I'm just not sure that mm -hmm. we'll have the time or the, the energy to be able to do a lot of the things that, that he's hoping that we'll be able to do. I mean, I think maybe the AIs will be able to connect a lot of things and for certain scholars and so on, that, that kind of, that kind of activity will be, will be done, but I'm just not opti I'm, I'm, I'm less optimistic about a lot of the, uh, the, the, the benefits or the, the ways that these sorts of things, these technological processes, are going to uh, to work themselves out uh, in in the um, in the future. But in any case, let's go ahead then, and I think this is a good place to shift into our uh, nitty gritty segment. Now, in the future, when we do uh, when we do fiction or the you know kind of books with plot and that sort of thing this will be the place where we'll say spoiler alert you should probably read the book or whatever before you before you come and, and, and listen to us talk about it and, and to some degree that's still probably true as far as something like this if you're going to read the book it would be probably most effective for you to read it and then come listen to this segment of the podca podcast but in any case this is where we're going to break down a little bit more in detail some of the things you know from each chapter kind of going chapter by chapter on what worth what we what we found most intriguing or most discussion worthy over the course of the book so let's go ahead and start with chapter 1 on becoming we're not necessarily going to hit every chapter of any book that, uh, of this book and certainly not going to hit every chapter of any book but um uh, or of every book but uh, we'll we'll go ahead and and start with chapter 1 here i know you had uh, especially enjoyed the chapter on becoming so go ahead and take your stab at that one yeah, and, and in my line of work where I, I work with clients on their their websites, I, I often begin to work with them as well on their, their technology and their personal technology, what they're using, their devices. And it amazes me how often I hear, and it seems like the higher the, per, the person is in their their job or their, their career, uh, how often I hear the term, I just don't understand how, how computers work. And it just... I know I was there uh, ten years ago. I was I was in that same place, but we're just getting to a point where you can't you can't have that mindset anymore, and you just got to dig in and, and start going. And and so I, I enjoyed that chapter on on becoming, which is the title of the chapter, and how we are all of us are are amateurs. We're all newbies, and that's okay. But you can't stay at that place. You've got to, you've got to start digging in. Yeah. And one of the things that he brings up in this chapter is, you know, right at the beginning, he talks about how in the past we, you know, at the beginning of, of all this digital stuff, we thought that, well, you know, now that you've got digital code and all this, that stuff's permanent. But as it turns out, even bits like non-material bits degrade and, you know, code corrodes and those sorts. I mean, it's, it's very strange on how all that works. And really that chapter is all about the process of maintenance. I mean, he says at one point existence, it seems, is chiefly maintenance. And mm -hmm. this idea that, that really as, uh, as things progress more and more, the reality is that, again, this is where that endless newbie is the new default for everyone quote comes in we're all going to be basically stuck having to constantly tend to the various, uh, the various aspects of, um, uh, of development. There's no, um, there's no just getting there. It's the, the, that, that, you know, suddenly we'll, we'll hit the singularity and the, and the machines will do everything for us. No, everything's still going to need to be maintained at all times. So yeah, and, and then the more, the more interconnected that everything becomes, the more maintenance that actually requires. Because if one thing is updated, everything else has to be updated to fit with that, 
that one initial update. Right. And it reminds me of, you know, the idea of the paperless office years and years ago that, you know, oh, if we mm -hmm. can just, you know, move everything to do it on computers, then, you know, we're not going to have paper anymore. And then, we, you know, we won't need uh, we won't need typists and so on. And yeah, typists got phased out. But guess what? Now you need an entire department of I.T., to handle the infrastructure for, you know, the stuff that just basic reports is done on now. So, um, there that basic reports are done on now. <clears throat> Grammar. It's good for you. Um, but, uh, but you know, that, that, that sort of thing where the growth of technology ultimately means the growth of a maintenance, uh, a maintenance infrastructure, uh, is, is I think a really important insight. And that's, I think one of the better chapters in the book, uh, mm -hmm. And one of the things that I, th I found interesting about that chapter is as everything gets, everything, pro uh, as all this progress gets moving, progress has to, the progress that we have has to a large degree been dependent on specialization. So you have people who are specialists and able to write code or design or do whatever, as opposed to everybody being a subsistence farmer who doesn't really have enough time to specialize on any one thing enough to invent something to improve life for everyone. Well, now mm. we're all in a position where specialization is, you know, you've got specialists of specialists of specialists now, right? I mean, everything is, is based on specialization, but at the same time, we're also all now having to kind of go back and learn to be jacks of all trades as well. Because just to handle the technology and just to do, you know, routine maintenance now, to, to do your digital hygiene now, you have to be a bit of a jack of all trades. As you said, you know, nobody can afford not to know, not to know some of this stuff at least. And so I thought that was one of the more interesting pieces of, of, that, of that chapter is looking at how, yeah, we're all dependent on specialization and, and specialization and the increase of specialization isn't going, going anywhere, but at the same time, we're also now having to go back to being jacks of all trades in some of these areas as well. Now, moving into well, this. And, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. Uh, the, the, the last part of that chapter, too, that I thought was great is as we become more specialized, uh, companies need to tap into that. And they're able to tap into specialization by people around the world through APIs, through forums, to where companies are not even have, having to hire for these types of yeah, they of don't things need export anymore. departments they can, anymore. Yeah, they could just they can uh, they can utilize the uh, the power of, of APIs and forums and hashtags, uh, all sorts of things like that to where uh, they can they can get the answers for their customers and and those answers not even be generated from within the company. Yeah, and that's where actually that's one of those places where I actually looked at that to a large degree as a negative because ultimately what that means is that those who develop the platforms and he really made a distinction between platforms and products. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, those who make the platforms, your Googles, your Facebooks, uh uh th those those types of companies who uh, uh put out a platform that then, you know, you can string together APIs and all this that depend on what, what they're what they're doing is they're depending on a large amount of essentially free labor by the by the user base. And yeah, the user base benefits from it. Otherwise, they wouldn't be putting in that labor. But at the same point, at some level, at some point, there's probably a tipping point where those the, the people who are providing that free labor are going to need to be able to make money doing something. And once, you know, mm -hmm. once platforms get to the place where they start to eat things, I wonder, you know, eat jobs and, and some of those things that like tech support and all, all that don't exist anymore. I, 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 I just wonder where where we wind up with some of those things uh, in the future with some of, you know, with our multinational corporation overlords, to, you know, to some degree. But uh, let's go ahead and move into uh, chapter two, Cognifying. And this is this chapter is really about uh about AI. It's about, you know, moving into cheap, powerful, ubiquitous artificial intelligence. Uh, and, you know, Kelly is to some degree, I, I thought he was kind of a moderate on AI. I mean, there, there are those out there um, who, you know, they're, they're basically looking toward a, with a, with a combination of either, uh, you know, 
optimism or dread, looking forward to a Skynet level, you know, self-aware U, uh, UI f- uh, sometime in the future, you know, your Ray Kurzweil's and, 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 and those folks. He's not, he, he actually doesn't get to that, that point of, you know, oh, well, you know, a self-aware AI is ultimately where things are going and, you know, we'll have to fear the computers kind of thing. But he is very optimistic about where AI is ultimately going to go. I mean, he's looking at AI as, uh, you know, deriving from the Internet of Things and just working off of basic algorithms uh, and, you know, self-teaching algorithms and so on to be able to to do things that human beings can't. Uh, and, you know, that that I think is is a more plausible way of understanding where AI is going than a lot of, I think, the futurists out there. Uh, I, I just as a as a philosophy of mind issue, I, I, I question whether or not I, I very much doubt whether in 200 years we'll have gotten anywhere closer to producing anything like uh, self-consciousness of, of from our uh, our machines and so on. I don't think that they're going to end up resembling us. It'll continue to be something where we're using them and we're sort of becoming integrated with them to some degree. But uh that's that's closer to what he does. Now, one quote that I thought was really interesting uh, was was this one. The first genuine AI will not be birthed in a standalone supercomputer, but in the super organism of a billion computer chips known as the net. It will be planetary in dimensions, but thin, embedded and loosely connected. It will be hard to tell where its thoughts begin and ours end. And one of the things that, that st- stuck to me about that particular quote is it sounds even as I think moderate in many respects as he is about AI uh, compared to some, some futurists, <laughs> this sounds a lot like humans creating God. <laughs> mm. You know, the idea of, of a God or a Jungian conception of God that, you know, you have this loosely connected planetary and dimension uh, super organism that's hard to tell where its thoughts begin and ours end. Mm-hmm. If I gave that description in another context, then lots of people would just say, oh, you're describing something, you're describing God or something like God. But that's what he's seeing AI become and envision. And actually in this chapter, as he talks about AI, he actually talks about in the future, you know, we're, we, we, we're going to need, as he puts it, the greatest benefit of the arrival of artificial intelligence is that AIs will help define humanity. We need AIs to tell us who we are. Now, I, yeah. I found that positively Nietzschean, <laughs> where, you know, God is dead. And so now in the absence of God, we need to find a way to create something outside ourselves in order to help define who we are. And and that to me is 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 a fascinating and somewhat disturbing kind of way to to think about some of these things, uh, but I think it puts some some flesh on sort of how he's envisioning things in this chapter, uh, and 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 this is one of the few chapters, by the way, where he he does get into the AI future is likely to be ruled by an oligarchy of two or three large general purpose cloud based commu- commercial intelligences. Now. I, for one, agree with that and find it horribly concerning. <laughs> yeah. I don't know what you're, where, where you fall in on that. But to me, if Google and Facebook, who basically claimed nearly every, it was like 99% of all of the uh, uh, additional advertising dollars that came into, into internet advertising in the last quarter of, of uh, uh, in the last reported quarter, 99% of those new dollars went to Facebook or Google if they become those oligarchic cloud-based commercial intelligences and say maybe you know Amazon gets thrown in there as the third one, who or what is going to be there to prevent the kinds of abuses that we've, that we've seen throughout human history whenever you get these kinds of oligarchies? Well, and I think the, the worst thing about what has been leaked is that not only are they in that powerful position, but they've, they've been providing a lot of information that that comes from us to the governments of the world so so n- now it's not even just the these large uh, companies um, but now you have a sharing of information between the companies that are able to get this information and and governments well at what point do they no longer need to share with the governments because they be- they effectively become the governments become one yeah. right I mean 
Yeah. At what point do these multinational uh, corporations say, listen, we know every Google search you've ever made, sir. And quite frankly, if you don't cooperate with what we want, then, you know, we'll have ways of, of making your life very difficult. Yeah. At what point do, does that happen? And that's where some of the cognifying stuff in this chapter, this kind of got me on the, uh, you know, on the little bit negative side, uh, thinking about the future, uh, as did another thing. I mean, he brought up this, th there's this quote where he says, toys that can converse, you know, toys with AI are lovable. Dolls may be the first really popular robots. And, you know, I made a note on that saying, is this really true? I I'm really skeptical because, you know, there, there is this thing called the uncanny valley, right? The closer to human, like you can, you, you, there's a certain point at which when a, an inanimate being or when an inanimate object become, becomes more and more lifelike, more and more human-like, there's that uncanny valley that's talked about where once it gets to a certain point, human beings go from attraction to revulsion. And so, you know, I wonder where does the uncanny valley start for these AI dolls, are toys that can right. are toys that can converse really more lovable? I mean, you think about how kids really, really love their stuffed animals, and part of the reason they love their stuffed animal is their stuffed animal becomes a part of them. Like they they populate that stuffed animal's mind. It's something that they learn to you know do with their imagination. I mean, this is Calvin and Hobbes stuff, right? Mm -hmm. If it's already doing that for you, but it's an artificial thing, is that actually something that's lovable? Or is that just an other that you can kind of dispose of in a different way because it, you don't actually grow the attachment to it that you do with, you know, your little, you know, the little stuffed animal that was put in your crib? I, that's something I really wonder about. I, I, don't, I don't know what your thought was on that as you read through. Well, I, I don't know if you caught the, uh, the story this past week from Germany where they Apparently, the a doll that came out in Germany was recording oh, conversations yeah, from the kids, that. and and there was a big uh, social media <laughs> thing to destroy the dolls. So I guess that that's an answer to some degree is is if um, if they're conversing or if, if it's more one sided where they're collecting the information. Um, the response, at least by the Germans, was to destroy these lovable dolls. Yeah, because they're an invasion of privacy and so on. Although, I, again, privacy to some degree is, and, and this is something that he talks about, privacy is, is disappearing mm -hmm. as, yeah. as more and more, you know, that's, that's one of the trends that he talks about is the, the disappearance of privacy, uh, which, again, I wonder at what level, to what level does that get before there's backlash? And, and, and that actually, I mean, I guess that is, and we'll, we'll return to this at the end, that, that you know, sort of put our, put our thumb on this or our, our finger in this particular uh, part of the book, that aspect of things really got, got me over and over again. I kept thinking about these trends saying, yes, yes, this is a trend, but at what point does, does the trend reverse? Because so often in human history, things are, 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 are like a pendulum, right? We respond, mm -hmm. we, we let things get to a certain point and then we rebel against them. And at what point do the iconoclasts come in and start ripping down the images once again, and at what point do, you know, do, do the more savage aspects of our nature or, you know, the more privacy uh, desiring aspects of our nature start to, you know, move in the opposite direction again and re react and respond against the trends as they've been as they've been going, say, the last 30 or 40 years in particular. I, mm -hmm. I wondered about that over and over again. At what point is that tipping point where we say, nope, no more. And in fact, we need to roll this back a lot if it can be. And then the question is then. Once there's that reaction, can it be rolled back? Will it be able mm -hmm. to be rolled back? Is mm -hmm. there going to be too much momentum? That's, that's one of the things that I kept thinking throughout this book. And again, this is one of the reasons that the book was well worth reading, is mm -hmm. it, you know, stimulating that aspect of thinking to me was very, very interesting. Well, and, and, he, and he talks about uh, privacy in the sense of... Uh, I, it, it was interesting because you, you talk about the past where... Back in history, you know, you, you would be a part of a small community and everyone would know everyone's business. So you didn't really have privacy then. 
um, and saying that that's probably more to where we're going in the future. But the problem right now is is if our information is being collected by groups, uh, whether that's companies or governments, it's one sided right now. We don't we're not able to look at those companies. We're not able to look at the governments, what they're doing. But if 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 it's completely one sided, where one group has all the information, that's unbelievably damaging, and uh, a, a huge potential for for a, a, a massive problem. Uh, so, I I thought it was good that he he brought he brought that up. But but he also talked about uh, and again maybe jumping ahead here, but talked about uh, how we're we're almost getting into this technical socialism. Um, and then how that would naturally kind of morph into a political socialism. And, and uh, that chapter terrified me. Yeah. Um, it, well, it not only terrified, it's not only terrifying, but I thought, again, it was horribly, horribly naive about how things tend to work. And it's one of those things, again, you know, communism works really great in theory, right up until you have, it, it runs into the buzzsaw of, the way people actually behave and mm -hmm. the reality that in order to enforce communism, you need an oligarchy of people who actually enforce those rules to say, mm -hmm. well, no, in fact, none of us have property, but those of us at the top happen to be the ones managing it. So, you know, all are equal, but some are more equal than others. You know, this is animal farm mm -hmm. stuff uh, with Orwell and, you know, that's the sort of stuff that, you know, where he's getting into that, into that, um, socialism stuff uh i thought again it was and this is in the sharing chapter this is chapter six where he's talking about well you know it's different from the top-down socialism of the industrial era because that one couldn't keep up with the innovations and so on but the real difference is that this this digital socialism is running over the borderless internet via network uh, networked communications generating intangible services throughout a tightly integrated global economy designed it is designed to heighten individual autonomy and thwart centralization it is decentralization ex uh uh, extreme, right? So that's what he says. Mm -hmm. And you're looking at that and you, you had, you had the same reaction I did, which was kind of terror. Like this is really scary, not because of the word socialism. I'm all, I'm all for socialism if we could manage it. But the problem is in this, in this, this thing where he's talking about, well, it's not like the, you know, red flag socialism. This one's run over a borderless internet via network communications, generating intangible services through a tightly integrated global economy. But m the note that I put here, uh, you know, I, I'm used, I used iBooks to, uh, to, to read this. The note that I've got here is, but again, this borderless internet and network communications this is all managed top down by huge multinational corporations that, you know, where you have two or three oligarchies who are managing the entire system, which means that but they effectively also... control it. So it's not decentralization extreme. It's decentralization on the one hand, completely controlled by these few oligarchies on uh, uh, at the very top, which then to me opens the, the door to some some horrible things. Well, but it's also optional at this point. Yeah, you know, to yeah. where and, 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 and so I, I can choose to be on Facebook or I can choose to be in. And, and yeah, there's there's major reasons to be on it, to be connected with friends and that sort of thing. But it's optional. And where he says it, it could just kind of morph into a political socialism, political so socialism is not optional uh, from how it's played out. So I to me, that was the difference between an option optional where everyone's sharing compared to a forced where everyone's sharing. And those are, are very, very different things. And once you start and see, this is one of the places where I think you, you put your you put your finger on it right there in. The, this is one of the places where I thought the book was weakest. And it's in looking at how the the digital world of bits and bytes and technology interface with the material world of real flesh and blood people. And I thought he, I thought Kelly did a great job of talking about the trends on the digital side, talking about you know the bits and bytes of things and how a lot of that stuff works. But the real concern and the real question of where all this is going to go 
and he admits this at the end of the book, in fairness. I mean, he, he does say at the end of the book, you know, I tried to give a more optimistic picture here. You know, I'm aware that, mm-hmm. you know, some of these things are going to have to really be managed well in order to prevent, you know, these multinational corporations from taking over and so on. So he, he, he acknowledges it at the end. And again, we see, you know, he, he was a, he, he was, uh, uh, a part of the uh, of the advisory team for Minority Report, where again it explores what happens when you get this technology, this you know, essentially artificial intelligence that then allows all this this asynchronous uh, connection. What happens with that, and how much does it really affect things on the ground? Well, in that case, in Minority Report, it's very dystopic, right? I mean, it wind you wind up with a really negative outcome and people have to rebel against it on the ground the place where again when you get when you're moving from what's happening online and in the realm of technology to the realm of people on the ground in you know living in real time rather than sort of the eternity of bits and bytes things really really do change Mm -hmm. and you know this is uh this gets back to you know, a couple other places in that particular chapter, in the sharing chapter, um, you know, this, where he says, uh, one of the things that I thought he was kind of naive about, actually, on the, on the digital side, actually, is communal aspects of, of digital culture run deep and wide. Wikipedia is just one notable example of an emerging collectivism. And he talks about how Wikipedia is this great example of something that grew basically ex nihilo, you know, in a grassroots fashion that at one point you had basically nothing. And then you just had a bunch of, of people who just of their own accord decided to contribute to this online encyclopedia. And it became this emerging collectivism, but that's not really true. Mm -hmm. That's not actually, that's not actually how Wikipedia started. You can't forget Wikipedia's beginning where, if you go to the, the, the articles on Wikipedia that have not been hyper edited, or if you just go back to the first edit of any of these Wikipedia articles, all of the oldest Wikipedia articles, you know where they came from? The Encyclopedia? Public Domain it's Encyclopedia Britannica. So what Wikipedia yeah. started with is just outdated Encyclopedia Britannica stuff, and then basically they said... Yeah, so anybody who wants to edit this and, you know, update it for, you know, for the present can go ahead and do that. But this was that's not what? grassroots. That's not emerging collectivism. That's starting with a prior sort of capitalist project of an, uh, that 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 becomes a public domain thing. It's starting with a prior massive achievement and then working in emerging collectivism to improve that project. And I think that's been the case with just about everything. I mean, you think about every, you know, Bitcoin, right? That is not something that was an emerging collectivism where you had a, a group of people that just sort of randomly came together to do something. You have uh, Sato- uh, Satoshi Nakamoto, who n- nobody knows who he is, but you have a guy who came came up with the with the theory, put out the put out the uh, the the white papers on it you know, writes the initial code, and then the co- collectivism improves that. And so there were places where I was, I was skeptical about his views of sharing throughout that chapter because you have this idea of like, well, sharing and sampling content is the new default. Yes, that's great. But at some point, someone actually has to start the process. And, and that doesn't really work unless you actually have something you know you you have to have it doesn't work with a with uh with a grassroots collectivist em, uh, you know emerging collectivism with nothing to start with you have to have something some substrate that 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 comes from yeah and and that w- wikipedia was the thing i just liked the most in the book uh <laughs> his his description about it because i i've had the chance to work in it a little bit uh, and so you've mentioned articles from the past where where there's already content and they could just take it and then and then improve upon it, you know, with with everyone having access to it. But if you take a look at how so how do you just create a Wikipedia page right now? Like what what if I wanted to create one about you? The only way I can do that is to point to news articles or publications online and those can be easily manipulated. So 
let's just say some uh, a major publication has just written a horrible hit piece on you. Um, <laughs> Give them time. And then I take that, yeah, I take that, and then I create a Wikipedia page on you based on that article where none of it is true or, or a very small percentage of it is true. Now it's on, now I've created a Wikipedia page and I've, I've linked to that article. So it, I, it's allowed to be up there because uh, it, a publication out there has, has this information. Now another publication looks at your Wikipedia page and writes an article about you. Now it's become a self-fulfilling prophecy and it's not true information. So it's very easy to manipulate uh, Wikipedia. The founder of Wikipedia was was discovered to have made changes to his own page, which are against Wikipedia's rules of, of engagement and, and all that sort of thing. <laughs> and so I, the more I the more I find out about Wikipedia, it's a great great place to start. It's a great place to just look and, and kind of get a start, but you cannot end there. And that is not the end all be all. And so for him to just describe it in this flowery, lovely language, it, it really turned me off because what I have seen of Wikipedia is just not, I, it is very easily manipulated. Yeah. And, and, and again, throughout this sharing chapter, I mean, I kept having, you know, all sorts of these issues. I mean, I, Another another place here. The technology of sharing enables the power of one fan who is willing to prepay an artist or an author to be aggregated with little effort together with hundreds of other fans into a significant pool of money. And, you know, he looks at Kickstarter and, you know, Indiegogo and some of these other things. And that's all great. But the real problem is the superstar effect, right? It's it, crowdfunding and all these things work great, uh, you know, where you have where you already have a following, you know, and, and this is where his 1000 true fans really does come, come into play. If you have a thousand true diehard fans, then yeah, the power of sharing allows Kickstarter and those things to do really well. But the problem is as, you know, as sharing basically, you know, runs the, 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 the ownership of, of ideas and things to zero, well, what happens for the, say, university professor who's pretty good in the classroom but isn't the very best when all the when when the lectures when the lectures from the 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 superstar are accessible online mm -hmm. or, you know, there's a Coursera course that pastors. the superstar has done or, yeah, pastors. We see this all the time in modern churches which have moved towards these. You know, there's a lot of multi-site churches, for example, where you have one superstar pastor in one area and then you have, you know, 12 or 15 different quote unquote church plants where they all get together and they watch a screen with this superstar pastor preaching mm -hmm. and you know, it's one of, and, and that is the direction, you know, that a lot of these things go. So he's very optimistic about, you know, sort of an emerging socialism online and then ultimately sort of working its way into real life, into, into material life. But to me, I see another factor here. And this, I thought, was in a lot of ways the weakest chapter in the book for that reason is I see a lot of opposite factors where with the advent of the sharing economy and with, or, or not even sharing economy, with the advent of, of, uh, with the destruction of the ideas of ownership of of uh, of ideas, and um, and you know increase the increase of of this trend of sharing that he talks about online, basically you have that superstar effect. So instead of getting a socialist, you know, sort of greater equality for everyone, the very top benefit the most and astronomically more than anything else. Uh, than, than anybody else does all the you know it completely eliminates the middle and basically you have the very top who benefit incredibly and those are the people who have the platforms or have the skills to you know become the superstars on the platforms and then everybody else is basically stuck as sort of peasant uh, as as sort of digital peasants if you will and that mm -hmm. that kept coming back up over and over and over again i mean getting back to uh, the chapter on flowing, um, which was chapter three, he talks about the four stages of flowing, right? Where something starts as fixed and rare, 
and you know each thing is an artisan work able to stand alone and you know they're sold in high quality reproductions to compensate the creators then you move to free and ubiquitous and the first disruption he says is promiscuous copying the, of the product duplicated so relentlessly that it becomes a commodity cheap perfect copies are spent freely dispersed anywhere there is demand so you know the idea of you know internet music or uh, you know thanks to the Russian hackers for the ability to get this kind of book for free right um so, you know, you get uh, these sorts of things uh, that, that that's number number two. Then you get flowing and sharing. The second disruption is an unbundling of the product into parts, each element flowing to find its own new uses to be remixed into new bundles. The product is now a stream of services issuing from the shared cloud. It becomes a platform for wealth and innovation. Yes. But what happens for the creator? Uh, creator hasn't really benefited now. Right. And then number four is opening and becoming. The third disruption is enabled by the previous two. And now streams of powerful services and ready pieces conveniently grabbed at little cost enable amateurs with little expertise to create new products and brand new categories of products. The, the status of creation is inverted. So the audience is now the artist. Output selection and quality skyrocket. First of all, I would say output and selection do skyrocket. I'm much more skeptical about quality as Wikipedia is a good example, as you mentioned, of quality needing really badly to be managed in order for that to work. Um, and secondly, the audience is now the artist. Yeah, that's great. But the audience isn't getting paid for that. And that means the artists aren't getting paid for that either, which means now the artists have to depend on something else to get paid, and the only people who are getting anything out of it are those who own the platforms, enabling the artist or enabling the audience to be the artist. Mm -hmm. So, to me, that that's a real again. This is where a lot of these trends I'm looking at, and I'm you know, it was horrifying. <laughs> yeah. You know, and and the well, and chapter was very much that for me. I mean, it you know, it just it was it was. There, there's a lot of scary stuff, frankly, in this very optimistic book. Yeah. In my more optimistic comment in this section on this page, I put curators of all things will continue to gain in importance. So I didn't, I didn't, I didn't go down that the rabbit hole of, of this is terrifying, but my, my initial thought was this is going to introduce so much additional content. We're, we're already seeing that. I mean, I, there's so many nights where uh, my wife and I, we never end up watching a movie because we've sat in front of Netflix for 45 minutes trying to find <laughs> one movie to watch. You're trying to choose uh, which one. It's the tyranny of choice, right? You're trying to yeah, choose which yeah. one you want, and Netflix's engine doesn't do a very good job of directing you towards the one that you know you're going to want. It yeah. overrates so everything. It, it's, you, you almost need a curator, and, and I know they're working on that, but but even this whole project of, of having a, a curated list of books to, to choose from I, that's just going to become more and more important as all this additional content gets gets added and created. Um, yeah, yeah, and with a ton of rabbit holes that we go, go down on that too. Well, but. and and I mean that's that is the essence of his chapter seven, right? Filtering that mm -hmm. you know ultimately. Mm -hmm. I mean, and so in that sense, you anticipated where he was going to go with well, curation is going to be everything. Because, mm -hmm. you know, there's going to be, you know, that 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 uh, that fire hose and more of of data that's just pouring out as the audiences. You know, you, you go to YouTube and it's amazing. Like you, you try to search for a highlight from a football game or something. And all of a sudden you, you see like a hundred thousand examples of someone having update up, uploaded a highlight from them playing Madden with said player. <laughs> As though someone actually wanted to watch replays of their game, like of their playing Xbox or PlayStation or something, as though someone actually wanted to watch that. And, you know, they, that's that's where you wind up going. And so well, and that's why, you know, he spends so much time in the filtering chapter talking about how AIs are going to need to be the new curators. Right. Because and, and also yeah. superstar curators as well. But that's the other thing is he undermines immediately with the idea that AIs will be the new curators he undermines the idea that now the superstar curators are, are the ones that are going to be benefit from this. The AIs then benefit. Yeah. Well, and, and I, I had earlier mentioned that there, there's these, these ideas that I'd never thought of before. Uh, <laughs> the, the filtering chapter really took it. So now, now you need curators and there, there's all this content. So what, what's the scarce resource here? Attention. 
Oh yeah. And so he brings up this idea of what, in, what about in the future, you may be able to start charging for your attention. So you would charge a company for the attention of watching their advertisement. Um, <laughs> And so it's just kind of like flipping everything. Yeah, I find that but it, but somewhat really impossible, but <laughs> yeah, yeah. But it, but it was an interesting thing to, to think through, and uh, you know, charging companies to watch to watch their ads. Well, um, I mean, I I can imagine that that I mean that's actually not as far fetched as it sounds, but I don't imagine that anybody's going to get paid much for it. That's the thing, right? If that's yeah. your source of income, then you're not go- you're not going to be yeah. eating well, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> And, and and getting back to again what your your whole thing about uh, about attention being the real commodity, I think that was maybe one of the two or three biggest points uh, mm-hmm. of this book. I think at the end of the day, is the attention uh, attention being the most uh, attention and time uh, uh, being the most important commodities that will exist in, you know, in, in now and in the future. And I think this is going to be something that's going to come up over the course of this podcast multiple times as we talk about different books is how this book really, f- again, reminded me of how much we need to be uh, conscious of the fact that more than anything else, the one resource that, that really is precious is time because it's the one thing that we have that is not fungible. It's not, uh, it can't be negotiated. You can't get it back. And it's limited. Like it's truly limited. And, and that aspect I think did come out in spades in this book. Uh, although I think again, for me, much more on the sort of a little bit frightened aspect about this. I mean, I don't like using that word necessarily, but I mean, that's, that's, that's sort of where it went. I mean, again, going back to your idea about, uh, trying to figure out what to what to watch or all of those things the flowing chapter chapter three i I have a note on that a horrifying tsunami of useless data and i reference uh huxley's a brave new world and neil postman's amusing ourselves to death as where this all seems to be going because he gets he gets to things like this quote pages and browsers are far less important Today, the prime units are flows and streams. We constantly monitor Twitter streams and the flows of posts on our Facebook wall. We stream photos, movies, and music. News banners stream across the bottom of TVs. We subscribe to YouTube streams called channels and RSS feeds from blogs. We're bathed in streams of notifications and updates. Our apps improve in a flow of upgrades. Tags have have replaced links. We tag and like in favorite moments in the streams. Some streams like Snapchat, WeChat, and WhatsApp operate totally in the present with no past or future. They just flow past. If you see something, fine. Then it's gone. There, I, I read that and I'm just like, I, you know, I I I I had this visceral reaction to that. <laughs> <laughs> because really? because i mean here i am i have all of the pretty much all of the, the the notifications on my phone and other devices off yeah right me too. i i don't I, like i have my text notifications on but my phone's on vibrate as often as not so that it doesn't distract me because i can't pay attention to it like my attention is so important to be able to put into writing and and doing in preparation for you know the stuff that i actually have to do to get paid for and those sorts of things that i don't want all of that stream stuff i have to i have to make sure that i don't have twitter open at different points I have to, you yeah. know, I, I rarely visit Facebook because if you get stuck in that stream, you never get out and then and you I, never I get anything worthwhile done. <laughs> yeah. And I didn't personalize that chapter as much as just think of, yeah, that, that is how. Yeah, so for for me, I didn't personalize this chapter as much. <laughs> to me, the interesting piece of it was that data does need to flow, and there's so much of it. And I just think of the stock ticker, and with stocks, you know, you've got so many stocks, and you can't you can't just list them out. Um, and so when you're in Times Square, that you've got that that fastly rolling by 
stock ticker. It's showing every stock, but um, it's just in a line. And then um, to where we went to the 24-hour news cycle, and, and they have the news ticker at the bottom. Uh, that That's kind of the de de default now. If you're following 100 people or more on Twitter, it, it has to it has to be presented that way. The content has to keep flowing for it to be in real time and for you to, to be able to keep uh, consuming the, the content. Yeah, but is real time really really what we want to pay attention to i mean that's the other the other side to this i mean yeah i follow more than 100 just just barely over 100 people on on twitter but i find that what I, what ends up happening is I, I i sort into lists or i sort into or or i actually search for the items that i actually want want to see instead of worrying about the instantaneous flow in all this and and you know one of the things that he think about it this way like there are a lot of people now, and particularly people who are younger than me, and this is this is a get off my lawn moment, right? I don't understand Snapchat at all. <laughs> like, I, I get the filters and that there's some like cool stuff you can do with that and, and that sort of thing. But once Snapchat stopped being basically a service for people to be able to sext one another, which is as far as I could tell, what it basically started out as. Yeah. Once it actually became a social network type thing where people just started posting <laughs> selfies and different things of themselves and all that. I, I've never had a Snapchat because I don't understand. Like if I'm going to be taking a picture, I want the, I'm taking a picture so that like in another moment, I can remember this moment. And if I'm taking a picture that then is just going to disappear, or if someone else is taking a picture, that's just going to disappear. Like what's the point? <laughs> and, and I guess that's where a lot of this comes to me. Yeah, but there is a differentiation, uh, um, and maybe it depends on the the topic as well. Uh, news and sports, those things are more more in real time. Whereas if you make a really important statement, or you're sharing the birth of your child, or something like that, or doing those a podcast are the things on that you, the inevitable. Yeah, <laughs> those are the things that you want to stick, um, and that that you do want. You, you know, you don't want the first photo of your child to disappear and. Um, you do want those things to be more permanent. So I, I think there are different, differing varies or different levels of, um, <laughs> of information and, and, and events that do cause, uh, people to respond and, and maybe that stuff's not going to be as valuable as, as someone who has sat down and thought through, uh, what they're writing and then releasing that. Yeah. And, and the, I guess the other part to this is, <sighs> It seems to me that the more stuff that gets into the stream, like the stuff that's actually streaming and, and on that like now moment, that stuff really isn't the important stuff. It's mm -hmm. one of those things like if, if there's something that I truly can't miss in this moment because, you know, it's, it's just this momentary thing, then to some degree that's not the important thing, right? That's not actually as important as something that, is going to have lasting value past that. So, you know, it, it, that's where I, I wonder, again, I, I just, I, I'm a little bit worried about the direction that he sees very optimistically, this, this, this uh, constant exponential growth of data. And he sees it as a, as a real positive as basically everything. I mean, uh, what was the, the what's the, the the Twitter message that's pinned on 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 Kevin Kelly's profile is basically what the uh, the optimists will rule the earth or the optimists will will shape the future or whatnot. Over over the long term, the future is decided by optimists. Is Kevin Kelly's pinned tweet? Yeah, there we go. Yeah, well, in my view, yeah, that may be true, but uh, it's that it may be determined by optimists, but certainly not in the directions that they typically anticipate. But yeah. You know, again, it, thinking about this this way, he's when he's saying each video demands a reply with another video based on it, the natural response to receiving a clip, a song, a text, either from a friend or a professional, is not just to consume it, but act upon it. And, and it's stuff like that where, yeah, that sounds great in theory. And yeah, that seems like that's kind of the trend or the direction that we're headed. But this all takes so much time. Like to take a clip or a song or a text and then to actually then respond with a clip or a song or a text or whatever, that all of that takes time. And the one thing that, you know, data, the amount of data 
that's getting put out there, the, the number of videos on YouTube, the number of songs that are out there. You, you can't listen to all this stuff or watch all this stuff in a, li- in, in a thousand lifetimes, but lifetimes aren't going to get much longer. And at some point, that's where, you know, as he said, you know, he, he talks about this steady titanic tilt toward dematerialization and decentralization. But the thing is, we're still material. We're still animals. Mm-hmm. We, we, we're, not, we're not going to become digital ourselves. And that's, to me, one of the big disconnects of this over and over again is I think he's right in so many ways about where you know, about a lot of the inevitable directions of technology and about digital technology in particular. But then how does it interface with our very time bound, very material bound? We have to eat, sleep, you know, do things like that, like actually worry about the the, the present realities of, of, of being embodied creatures. How does it, how does it interface with that? And that's the part that I just, I, 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 I didn't see a whole lot of in, in this book in ways that made a lot of sense to me, or at least were th- things that I could be optimistic about. Mm-hmm. So do curators become um, <laughs> elevated in this uh, this new reality? Yeah, to downshift there. I mean, that is another thing that he talks about, and that is how he, I, I think he's right, that with the influx of all of that content, curators become that much more important. And And, and you know, this is something that, in the uh, segment that unfortunately we lost due to the technical difficulties, uh, you had been talking about how, uh, how curators were, you know, going to be that much more valuable. And I agree with that, that curators are going to be more valuable, but then he, he basically double crosses that and says, yeah, but the real curators are going to be AI. And, you know, how good is the AI going to have to be, first of all, to do that? I mean, we've got some, algorithms and things for uh for amazon and for netflix and all that but you know netflix doesn't always do that great a job you wind up looking through all this stuff like you said before looking through this stuff just looking for one thing that you want to watch and you spend 40 minutes doing that and then then it's time for bed well and and amazon's advertising for you for a product you just purchased three days ago on (laughs) on other sites so yeah there's truth to that got a ways to go but well, don't worry, though. Once Amazon has monopolized everybody else out of the business, then they'll be able to, you know, know exactly what you purchase because you won't be able to purchase from anybody else. Right. And that'll, of course, be a positive. Yeah. And then you'll go down one particular avenue, I guess. Right. And <laughs> never, never be. So now am I infecting you with, with my other ideas, uh, with my pessimism here? Yeah. But I but he, uh, I can't remember where it was, but he brings up later. uh the idea of people who learn to like this. And I thought that was cool. So in the future, maybe it's not just people who liked this product bought this, but people who bought this product learned to, to like this. And that seems kind of a a neat idea, I guess, in terms of AI being able to, um, to anticipate, I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Again, I, I'm a little skeptical with some of that stuff, but but I do think AI is going to improve dramatically, and you know, as again, the, as as more data gets in there. But how much better is it actually going to be, uh, given that we're still going to have to be the ones to in, interpret it? And we re- humans tend to rebel against things that tell us what we're going to like anyway, in a lot of cases. So, uh, and that that brings us to uh, a, a couple of our last points here that we've we've got down on the list. Uh, in the interest of time, I mean, I'm just going to read this one piece that, that stood out to me again. Uh, what are humans for? I believe our first answer will be humans are for inventing new kinds of intelligences that biology could not evolve. Our job is to make machines that think different, to create alien intelligences. We should really call AIs AAs for artificial aliens. And again, my reaction to that was this seems extraordinarily ethically empty. Why would our first answer for what humans are for be to invent new kinds of intelligences that biology could not evolve that like, again, there's no real point to that as far as I can tell. And I, 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 I was extremely unpersuaded whenever, uh, whenever things got into some of the ethics, the attempts to bring ethics out of, out of some of this discussion. I don't know where you came in on that. 
Yeah, and, and of trying to find out what our purpose is, like as we get deeper into AI that we're going to have to somehow go back to the basics to find out who humans are. And uh, I was, I, that got a little weird for me. Well, again, like we said earlier in the, in the podcast, it seemed very Nietzschean to me that, you know, well, without God, you know, God is dead. So now humanity has to cope with not having built in meaning coming from, the idea of God. And now, you know, we have to define our own meaning in the world. I mean, this is all existentialism to some degree. Uh, you have to, you know, you're thrust into the world and now you have to make your own meaning. Uh, and it seems to me that Kelly is happy with the idea that the meaning to be made is simply making new intelligences, which again, to me, unless there's some sort of utilitarian purpose for those intelligences, I mean, I'm going to quote from my father here, if technology is not transformative, it's useless. Mm -hmm. It's it's actually, if, or actually what he likes to say is if technology is not transformative, it's in the way. And, um, you know, that's where, uh, you know, if, te if, if we're looking to technology for our ethics or for the why in, it, in and of itself, I think that's going to be even more empty than the current anomie that we, we deal with in, in our modern, you know, in our modern culture where we're always concerned and obsessed with identity and all this in the absence of, tr you know, more traditional family ties and location and, and different things that, you know, in the past served, f served for the why and in, anyhow. So I think you had the next piece that we were going to look at in terms of, um, of the, uh, of the, the final few specifics before we wrap it up here. Yeah. One thing that stuck out to me was from, uh, the, the second chap chapter of, uh, cognifying where he goes into what robots can do compared to humans. And, uh, my first job out of college was, was working at, at an apparel company. And I just saw just such weird stuff where we would make fabric in the United States, ship it down to Mexico. <laughs> and then, have them cut it, sew it, ship it back to the place that started in the States and then be distributed from there to Canada for sale. And all of that made sense uh, because of labor costs and relatively low transportation costs. Uh, but what happens when robots can do more of the work and robots can do more of the transportation that's going to localize the production again. Uh, and he goes into that a little bit. And I, I just thought it was interesting because we have so much stuff coming from Asia and, um, all over the world. And it's based largely at this point on, on shipping containers and the ability to, to, to ship large quantities of, of things, uh, for relatively cheap. But what happened uh, to, in order to, to, to take advantage of, of uh, low labor costs, but what happens when those labor costs go down due to more productivity here and then also uh, shipping costs go down with, with the, there being talk of almost a, a driverless uh, trucking industry and, and that sort of thing starting to, to take place in the States. Uh, all of a sudden, your production comes back here. And, and so now we have a, have a president who's, talking about bringing production back here yeah, of but course. what if that just begins to happen naturally yeah i, I and, and i mean the pr the current president's bluster about a lot of that uh bringing jobs back and, and and all that by you know by trade by you know different different trade uh deals and and trying to uh bring factory jobs back and all that those factory jobs aren't coming back because of this autom automation mm -hmm. uh and and Again, for me, I, I, I looked at the flip side of that. Yes, it's going to probably localize manufacturing uh, it, it, a, a bit more than it has been because labor will be cheaper with robot, robotization, although the ability to actually handle those robots or program those robots or do you know ma manage those robots will, be, will require uh, a higher level of training that will probably at least initially be more focused in, in the West where, uh, where more of that training will, will be based. But, um, but the thing that I kept thinking is, okay, you know, in the past, each time we've had some sort of radical 
economic uh, change, whether that be uh, industrialization and then getting into the post-industrial world where, you know, suddenly you have the advent of a bunch of service jobs and then you have, uh, you know, industrialization move people off the farms and in, in, into cities and all these things and you know new jobs were created uh, uh, because of the creative destruction of uh, after the creative destruction of the old ones there is a certain point where though where when the machines or when uh, when these other jobs can basically be done without people and they can be done more cheaply without people those who own the capital those who have the ability to then get those robots or those uh, that automation to do their work don't have to pay regular, you know, non-capital owning, non-landed gentry to use, you know, the old language of that. They don't have to pay the 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 working men, working women to actually do those things. So how then what what then does that mean for people who not only I mean we talk about maybe a basic income guarantee or something like that for the future when you know people just continue to not have jobs or whatever if the creative destruction doesn't wind up creating more jobs yeah a basic income guarantee may happen or whatever but so many people I mean without work work gives people a large amount of their identity mm -hmm. what happens when there isn't anything that you really feel like you can do to contribute to society in that way. What happens when work really isn't an option? Now, sure, I mean, we can turn to the arts and there's entertainment things and all that, but not everybody can be a filmmaker. Not everybody can be an actor. Not everybody is, you know, is going to to be somebody who can who can at least make some meaning in, in those ways. And and certainly as you know, I, I think we've seen with things like sports, you know, it used to be that sports were the sorts of things that everybody played. You know, you get one factory against the other and all the guys would get together and they'd play against each other and all this. Now we have professional sports and people sit down and they watch other people play sports for them. Mm -hmm. And so I wonder, I wonder about that trajectory, which seems to me to be inevitable as well, which ties into some of this. And again, it gets back to the, to the material thing and how quickly people again start to rebel against that because they feel like their lives don't have meaning. And, you know, the idea that, well, there are other people out there who are making artificial intelligences and, you know, they therefore are defining our meaning as a species. That doesn't seem to me like it'll be good enough for, you know, the average Joe who in the past would have had a blue collar job, but now it's, you know, the iRobot factory series that's taking that job. Yeah. And so maybe, well, I, I thought this book was a, a great, uh, j j very interesting. He brought up a lot of great points. But with, <laughs> with what we're just discussing, it's probably a good idea to combine this book with another point of view. And what, what I found was interesting is that Mark Goodman, who suggested this book in The Tools of Titans, uh, took a lot of the items that Kelly discussed in the book and showed how these meta changes can be exploited. So for instance, for instance, uh, Goodman had, a, has a chapter in his book, uh, future crimes in screens we trust. And Mo, it has another chapter called Mo screens, Mo problems. And, uh, Kelly's chapter in his book is screening. And so, Goodman just shows how all the things that can go wrong with, with our screens. And then uh, Goodman has a chapter called Big Data, Big Risk, and uh, Kelly's chapter on tracking. And so it, it was interesting to, 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 to look at the different chapters in both of these books and see how uh, very overly <laughs> optimistic in, on Kelly's side and then um, maybe the more realistic view. Uh, and, and as we mentioned before, the, the person called the anti-Kelly uh, anti would also be a good uh, good person to to uh, to read along with this book. So, um, uh, and that was Nicholas Carr's. And Nicholas Carr has a book called Utopia is Creepy. Uh, so that could be a proper balance. Or uh, as I also put down uh, 1984 or Animal Farm, uh, those types of books too, just to see how 
uh, <laughs> this could go terribly wrong as well. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 exactly. And I mean, there's all all sorts of uh, you know a host of movies in this genre about how you know the uh, the 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 gathering together of a few oligarchic uh, corp- multinational corporations with uh, you know interests in government and so on. Once technology gets to the place where they can get whatever they want things don't go so well. So, I mean, yeah, it's not like, uh, not like that's not a big trope. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but in any case, yeah, I think, I think it would be good, uh, coming back out to the big picture to close. And, you know, I, I agree that this book should be read in conjunction with those books. I think this book is worth the read. I, I really mm-hmm. do. I think that it's the sort of thing that even though I disagreed with a lot of the optimism of it, there are, there's a lot of food for thought in this book about where things are, where the momentum is going. And, um, and, you know, all the way down to, you know, again, one of the points we didn't really hit, which was the end of ownership, which he talked about, you know, that, well, you know, everybody just, you know, subscribes to things, so you don't have to own anything. And again, you know, for me, I look at that and I go, well, that's kind of horrifying, because then the people who do own are able to charge rent and basically, you know, do whatever off of the people who don't own. But, um, but, I do think that this was a worthwhile book and, and, and had a lot to say about the momentum of where things, where things are headed about. Um, I think there are ideas that can be, can be gleaned from this to help, you know, if there's, if there's people in the tech world or, you know, a, a creatives out there who are trying to envision, you know, what is, what, what, what are things going to look like if I'm going to be successful in my field as a creative or as a, you know, uh, as, as a, in, in the tech industry or in anything else in 15 years, this is a useful book for that. I, at least I think. Yeah. I, I think, uh, for students, especially uh, college, college students, this would be a great book to read, to, to get ideas on, on areas that they could pursue he gives so many, so many different ideas and based on current trends that we're seeing and then potential, how that could move forward services that would need to be provided for how those things would move forward. So yeah, if for nothing else, you get some really good ideas on, on potential business ideas or ways that education could be changing, uh, technology could be changing in the future. Yeah, I, and I think that that's probably a, a good place to wrap uh, wrap this episode. So um, that's going to do it for us today. Now, before we get out of here, just a reminder, you can follow along with us at booksoftitans.com. And of course, ping us on Twitter or Instagram at Books of Titans. And if you haven't already done so, you can subscribe to this podcast and find, well, all of our future episodes through iTunes, the Android Marketplace, or your podcast manager of choice. And if you are enjoying this podcast, please make sure to give us an effusive five-star rating. <laughs> on iTunes and share your favorite episodes on social media. And even by letter, you could write, you could write a letter to somebody and tell them about it. (laughs) The oldest form of social media. (laughs) We'll be back soon to discuss the next book, which will be the old man in the sea by Ernest Hemingway. On behalf of Jason Staples, I'm Eric Rostad, and this has been the books of Titans podcast. Thanks for listening. I made this.